to me uh, in real estate, net sheets are extremely important because it's completely impossible to evaluate an offer without one. And it's completely impossible to explain your service to a seller without providing the cost of the service. And so, um, Michelle, you just asked the question, uh, when do I present it? And I think every time financial items in the contract occur or change, it takes absolutely no time almost to do a net sheet. When perfected correctly and understood correctly, they can be done in as simple as five minutes. Um, pretty much everything I'm going to tell you is on an app. Uh, Tycor, Chicago, every f and company, First American, all of them will provide a free app uh, for like $10, you can get it without uh, ads, but it will do a quick, simple net sheet. And the whole reason behind it is, is that people a lot of times don't believe salespeople. They don't believe them that they're in their best interest. And so they think that sometimes we're lying to them. But when I put numbers in front of you, they're a little hard to lie, right? I mean, if I actually am open about everything, if I show you where the costs are going to, um, it really does a good job of selling your value because you're the concierge of the entire transaction as their agent. It's your job to assimilate all the information to you that's being told to them, uh, the things being told by the lender, the things being told by the title company. And it's your job to weed through all of it to make sure that it conforms to what was contracted, to conforms to what they wanted to achieve um, and making sure that nothing was missed or uh, miscalculated. I can't tell you the number of closing statements that I've seen that were wrong. They had things in the wrong places. They were calculated incorrectly. I've seen estimates that have come from different parties that are wrong. They don't even conform to the right price. I've seen closing costs that should have gone to the client that they had going back to the seller because it wasn't used and no one asked the question, uh, you know, how are we going to use this money up? And so the whole point of it is that you have a fiduciary duty to account for the money in the transaction. It actually says it on the duties owed that you are going to make sure that their funds are adequately taken care of. And so if you don't do a net sheet, and I don't care what anyone else says, this is my personal opinion. If you don't do a net sheet, how can you adequately account for the money, right? And have you really done your job when you don't show me the figures? And so um, to the question of when do I share the commission and the transaction fee up front? I mean, if you write an offer for me after we've been together for three months looking at properties, right? Because I was lowballing every home that's out there. And then we finally find the home that I want. And all of a sudden you throw in a fee of, you know, $600 or whatever it is, or your extra commission, I'm going to feel like I'm being taken advantage of. But if it was done initially, right when we met, when I said to you, Hey, I want to buy a $400,000 house. That's my approval letter. That's the most I want to spend. And you do a net sheet showing me the costs and fees to purchase a $400,000 house based on an estimate that you got from my lender and what your fees are and what the average title fees and everything will be for the transaction. I'm going to feel really good to know that you're truthful with me that we know about it up front and I'm going to be on board with it so that I know that that's a fee I'm going to incur. Now, the question is most of the time, well, what if they decline to pay it? I'm going to tell you really simple how to sell a fee. Do you want to buy a house? They say, yes. I say, great. Do you understand it's going to cost money to buy the house? And they say, well, of course we do. Great. These are the fees that you're going to be paying for my service. The one who is here working for free until you actually close on the home. And I want you to understand the word free, which I just used. Nothing in this world is free. But ironically, in my business, we could go through the entire transaction. We could find the perfect home. I could write the offer. We could go through the inspection. We could get to the appraisal. And the entire deal canceled for some reason that I had nothing to do with, but I pointed out to you to protect you. And I will have done all of that for free, right? And so what I, my job to you, Mr. Buyer or Mrs. Seller, is to tell you what the costs are. And I'm willing to risk my commission to get you the right house and only get paid when it's actually going to close. And I think that's the one thing agents never tell their clients is that I may end up doing the whole thing for nothing because nothing ever happens. But at the end of the day, I was up front and I told you what my fees are and you acknowledge them beforehand and you agree to them. And I'm going to commit to you that every time the money changes, every time the price changes, every time the circumstances change, I'm going to update an estimate so that you understand what it should be and instead of just figuring it out later on. Now, again, at the top of the page, it says estimated costs. So it doesn't say actuals because of the fact that we don't actually know what could transpire and changing a day, one day in prorations could cause the uh, net sheet to change dramatically. And so I think the whole point is I'm just providing them with a little bit of a roadmap, a little bit of a guideline of all the information we know to be true. So of course, uh, the GLVR created this document from the Board of Realtors. 
to talk about you know what what regular costs are i'm not actually going to do a net sheet but i'm going to explain the different pieces of a net sheet and feel free to ask me at any time if you have questions on how they're factored now number one i have to have a reasonable price or understanding of price to be able to do an estimate so if it's a buyer that's going to be buying a home and their approval letter says five hundred thousand. Well, I always want to do the net sheet based on the worst case scenario. So if it's 500,000 and that's their max price, I'm going to do the net sheet based on them buying the biggest house they can. If it's a seller and they tell me that they want to sell their home and I say it's worth 400 and they want to list it for 425, I'm going to do my net sheet at 400 because I'm going to do it at the worst possible scenario of what I know it will work at because everything more, no one ever gets upset when they get more money. They only get upset when it costs them more money or they don't get as much money. And so I always, it's been my rule of thumb to always do worst case scenario in each of these. Um, we provided this net sheet to be able to do a number of different type of factorizations. So cash, conventional FHA, VA, uh, assuming the loan or seller financing, all of them have different terms, but they're all provided in this net sheet together. So understand that some of these boxes won't be used. So of course, um, the easiest way to figure out the lender costs uh, I, I was told I was old uh, when I called up Shelly and asked for a good faith estimate and they don't call it that anymore. They call it a statement of fees or statement of costs. But the idea is that I can't help a buyer with a net sheet unless I've called their lender and say, what program are they going on? What down payment are you expecting? What interest rate are we looking at? And what are your fees? Now, do I fight the lender over their fees? Yeah. Heck, the last thing the real estate agent wants to do is sit there and fight someone over fees that they charge for doing their job. And I would expect the lender has the same courtesy. I've had lenders go and tell their client, well, call your realtor up and tell them to remove that transaction fee. It's just a junk fee anyway. And I guarantee you that was the last deal that lender and I ever did together. But the point is I'm gonna respect them and they respect me, but I'm gonna itemize what their fees are. So at least when I do the net sheet, it's somewhat accurate. Yet the better my client's gonna think I do at my job. So of course, most lenders charge a loan origination fee. Uh, the estimate to use is about 1%. Uh, right now, even with interest rates being the lowest they've been in like two decades, uh, we still peop see people buying down rates. Um, it's a way to use closing costs uh, at new home builders. New home builders are willing to give up certain amounts of money. Just had one last week, last month, uh, VA buyer, the builder gave him $16,000. He was only able to use $12,000. So we took the other four grand instead of it going back to the seller, right? We used it to buy down his rate. His VA rate was already like uh, 3.8. He bought it down to like 2.9. And so the cool thing was he basically saved three or $400 every single month uh, for that money that he invested now. Um, underwriting fees, usually $500 on most. Um, most lenders are going to have a prep, doc prep or, or doc processing fee. Um, if I didn't know anything about the lender, I'm going to probably put in $500 for each of those. And I guarantee you that somewhere else there'll be some fee that comes up because of you know, credit report or something, but why not, why not have it listed down? Appraisal fee, even though the appraisal is paid for in advance um, by the buyer usually, we still wanna put it in here because it's an estimate of all the costs they're gonna incur, not just the costs that they're gonna incur. And so I usually will put in about $600 because as you know, um, appraisals have gotten more and more expensive, uh, but 600 bucks is about average. Credit report's about $40. Uh, tax service uh, it doesn't really usually apply, so I'm not even going to go into it, but flood certification, anywhere from $25 to $45. Um, unless you're doing uh, some owner carry financing or a wrap uh, or a VA assume, uh, assumable loan, uh, you won't usually even see that, but it's possible here. Um, prorations. So prorations are the amount of money I have to pay out of my pocket. I can't take it from closing costs. It physically has to come from me as the buyer. And it's the amount of money I pay from when I buy the property through the end of the month. And so every single home that's bought uh, will have some type of prorations. Even if it's cash, there'll be prorations because it's just the fact that you only pay for when you own the home. Um, you'll see this factored usually uh, by the escrow company. They'll do an estimated close date. That's why there's multiple dates listed on the closing disclosure. And it's because of prorations. You always want to pad prorations a little bit because as you know, you have a buyer that's closing, uh, you know, the end of a week on a Friday, some horrible thing happened with their loan or some horrible extension happened because the seller isn't prepared to move. And now the close date shifts to Monday. Well, you've now just added three more days into the proration. So making that sure that you have a pad, 
helps a lot. Um, before I do a net sheet, usually I'll print out a tax record or the listing agreement on the property so that I can see what its taxes are, but I'm just gonna give you quick estimates. So if I have an interest rate of 5% um, and my loan amount is $200,000 and I take that 5%, that means that the interest I'm gonna pay in a year is $10,000. I take that $10,000 and I divide it by 12, which gives me my monthly interest of $833 uh, a month that I'm paying in interest usually on that loan. Uh, and then we always divide by 30 days. We always use 30 day months in real estate, um, even though we have February and uh, some months have 31 days, but that's always the factor you use. So that means that if I divide it by 30, I'm paying $27.77 on a 5% interest rate on a $200,000 loan in interest per day. And so I go to my contract and I look at the close date being the 20th of the month. And I know that my client's going to have 10 days of interest prorations. So I take that daily amount, which is what I would put in that box right next to it. I times it times 10, the number of days, I come out with my proration. Same thing with taxes and insurance. For the taxes on the property, I'm gonna go straight to the tax record. I'm gonna take that amount and divide it by 12. And most of the time they're gonna impound two to three months of taxes on any loan. And so be high on the estimate, put three months. It's not a bad thing, but that's how tax payments are usually done. And so take that monthly rate times it times three, and then you have your prorated amount. And then insurance is a hard one to factor. If you don't actually have an interest, uh, insurance uh, binder or bid, uh, it's hard to say. So most of us use a formula. Um, I use 0.004% of the price of the home. Um, that it's just, it's always been really close for me. I take that amount, which is the annual cost of the insurance. I times it times 14, uh, 14 months of insurance because usually they impound uh, that first year and with any insurance policy, there's a premium. And again, I'm just giving them an estimate. It doesn't have to be perfect. If we get down to closing and the lender says, hey, we're only impounding three months of insurance, then I know to only uh, put on that net sheet once we get the, to that point, I can change it to match that if I want to. But again, it's still within my estimate. The reason why we have other boxes on each of these is so that you can pad yourself a little bit for things that you're unsure of. Um, if you were in a property that had a lot of associations or it had um, multiple different uh, municipalities or something like that that's weird, you could put in a small pad of $200 or $300. Um, if you're closing at the end of the month, not by your choice, but because it happened that way, um, you would probably want to pad a couple of days of prorations down there uh, just because of the way it changes. Prorations are really important when it comes to first time home buyers, because if you have a buyer that's financially strapped with cash and you're closing them on the first of the month, that buyer is coming out of pocket up front for 29 days of prorations. So if I close date to the end of the month, like the 23rd or 24th, I've just taken the amount of out of pocket expenses from that buyer and dropped it down to six to seven days. You start to think about that, that makes a massive difference in their out-of-pocket expense. Next to title and escrow fees, the reason why I say that the apps are usually better is because um, every title company provides an app of some type to help you factor those. Um, I, I use Tycor in most of my business, and so I have Tycor's app. And if I put in the property um, uh, price, it'll tell me exactly what the escrow fee is. But recording fees right now, I usually estimate about $150. Um, seems to be I've, I've been right because they have a number of smaller fees that they tack on. And we'll talk about those in a second. Um, the escrow fee is customarily split 50-50. And on a $200,000 property, most of the companies have a minimum of $400 that they charge per side. And so um, I would probably estimate that min minimum of $400. The owner's title insurance policy, of course, buyer or seller, depending on who it is, um, is the, usually the second to third largest uh, cost a seller is going to have after the commissions. The um, buyer would not pay the owner's title policy. They would instead would pay their lender's title policy. But again, all you need to do is get a, they don't even give rate books anymore, which we used to have at every office. It was just a statement of all the fees that they charge. Uh, but the idea is call up the escrow officer and say, can you go over what the fees would be for this property? In worst case, I, download the app. It'll make your life so much easier. Um, inspection fees. So one of the interesting things, title insurance basically is a search of title from the time that property was created or, or uh, first deeded uh, to now. 
And so a lot of uh, escrow companies now charge an inspection fee, excuse me, title companies to go back and inspect a title to make sure that it's free and clear or that they understand any uh, encumber encumbrances to that property. And so I've seen that as high as $150. Um, but it's just a question of looking and, and, and checking that out. Um, I've had many times where something's popped up on a title that they found. And, and so that's real work that they actually do by endorsing that. Closing protection just means they're guaranteeing it. I think it's a, a interesting fee, but I'm not gonna knock it. Uh, same thing with endorsement. I always put in a mobile notary fee of around 200 to $300. It never fails that everyone goes out of town uh, when I list their home and it always sells while they're out of town. And so usually you're having to send a notary somewhere to sign them and they ain't cheap. And so usually it's about, um, you know, 150 to, to $250 for that notary, depending on where the person is located. Um, real property transfer tax is the amount of money that I'm paying to the, the county uh, for the transfer of my property. It's very easy to factor. It's $5 and 10 cents for every thousand dollars on the property for the sales price. And so if it was a $200,000 property, uh, for instance, that's 200 times 5.1, and that comes out to $1,000, $1,020. Um, that's usually always paid for by the seller. Everything in the real estate contract is negotiable, so I could, as a buyer, pay for it. Um, when we had a hot market with multiple offers, we saw a number of buyer's agents put that fee on the buyer's side just to entice the seller to a better net. Again, if you don't do a net sheet, how do you know it's a better net? But that was the whole point of doing it. Um, Prorations, again, for utilities and assessments are things that I don't, it's kind of minutia to me to sit down and factor a sewer uh, proration. So I usually average what, what a month of sewer would be, probably $30, a month of trash, $30. Um, you know, if there's a special assessment such as a sit or a lid, I could also factor those in. But again, they're all assumptions that I'm putting out there. And so putting $100 there for things that you'll see later won't hurt you. Again, the commission is self-explanatory. We put in two sections so that you could put in your commission there. Now, when I show a net sheet to a client, I show the price and I show, I show the fees on the front page, but I come down to the bottom and I say, so for total estimated cost is going to be X. I don't go and point at my commission and say, hey, and that's what I get because it's not a good sales tactic, right? But when they see the bottom estimate, they understand it does include my commission that's listed. Um, I put in my compensation for um, my transaction fee in there. Um, I charge $5.95 as my transaction fee, along with my commission guarantee of 3%. So if you were looking at a property that you're writing an offer on that's at two and a half, and you're on the buyer side, you would put your extra half a percent commission on there, but that's all you'd have to do. This next section on common interest communities is the number one reason why sellers get mad at their agent and don't refer to them is because you never told them when they were selling their home that they were gonna incur two HOA packages and possibly a rush on each of them. And so now there's a thousand dollars in upfront costs they're gonna have to pay and you never said a word about it. So don't be that person. Um, there's also the demand fee that you're paying upfront because when they require a demand from the HOA, they're also pretty pricey. They can be anywhere from a hundred to $200. The rush fees are also a hundred to $200. So when you just think of a property that's in Summerlin in the Vistas, that's two to three HOAs. That's a big chunk of money that I would hate to find out about a couple of days before uh, or after we've opened escrow. I'd like to know and be able to plan for it way back in advance. For a seller, I always put on the fact that they have to purchase the resale package, right? So you're listing these things here. You can guesstimate on the contribution or transfer fee if they apply. The reason why we have the HOA's phone number listed in the MLS so you as the agent could call up that number and say, uh, can you tell me what the contribution or transfer fees are for this association? If they won't tell you the answer, have your seller call. Your seller has a right to know and they can get the info. Home inspection. Uh, home inspection now is going to be around $300 to $350. Um, I'm always going to guesstimate that as for a buyer. I'm always going to take for granted that they are going to do a home inspection because it's a good idea. And so I always put it in there to let them know it's an upfront cost. If it's a VA client, they have to have the termite paid for by the seller. Um, so I would have to put that on the seller side and say, you know, Mr. Seller, you're going to pay 50 to hundred dollars for this termite inspection that's required for their loan. But again, how can I ask a seller if they'll accept VA financing if I don't show them the fees they could incur? 
Um, home warranty, about you know, $500 to $600, depending on the size of the house. Um, we added this section deposits and rents because we have so many properties that are being conveyed that are tenant occupied. And so if it's a tenant occupied property, um, there'll be rent prorations that will happen that will have to come from the property management company, or if it's a seller that's selling a rental property and they're self-managing, I need to know that they have a $2,000 security deposit. I need to know that the rent is $1,000 a month because if we convey the property and no one ever looked to make sure that that money was transferred, my new buyer is gonna have to pay that money out of their pocket when they go to uh, move that tenant out. And so I always wanna make sure that those are transferred through escrow, but they're, um, they're noted here. Uh, this new document also has a section for earnest money. So I know it sounds funny, but Mr. Buyer, I told you that you'd have to have some money to use for EMD. Uh, I've also put it on your estimate so that you know that that's part of the cost. Um, sometimes with a seller, when I'm doing their repair, I'll put $1,000 in for possible repairs. Um, after 15 years in this business and lots of closings, I've very rarely seen someone not find something to fix in a property. And so I think that you should have some uh, type of uh, repair credit or contribution amount, but that's why it's there. And I always put a pad. Most escrow companies on every transaction will put a $300 pad. So I do the same minimum. Um, I'll put sometimes $500 if it's between two to $500,000. Uh, my client will always go, what's this pad for? I said, exactly. I have no idea. It's for anything that could come up that I don't know about that could happen during the transaction. Is there any questions on that front page of things that don't make sense, don't understand how to factor it, uh, that you'd like me to expand on? Nope. Okay, great. So um, you're gonna laugh, but this document has more initials than most uh, documents in the transaction. The reason why we have an initial on each page is to confirm that they actually saw it, that they read it, or hopefully that they read it. And so that's why it is really important that if you do the net sheet, you get an initial confirming that they did. Um, I think it, it comes back to protection for you. A lot of clients get amnesia and say, well, my agent never told me. Oh, they never told you, but yet you initialed it? How, how, did, how did that happen? You know, it, it's a way to protect yourself. Um, and it's just good business, in my opinion. So now the second page, um, we're going to talk about some more factors on, on the seller side. I'm going to be able to show my seller that, you know, if you list your home for 200000 and we have about $15,000 in closing costs, um, you're going to have proceeds of 185000 Well, that doesn't mean that they're going to put $185,000 in the bank necessarily. But if you're not really doing the due diligence and explaining it, there are people that actually believe they're going to get all the money and they don't have to pay off the loans on their property. I know that that's not rational, but again, we work with the public and you never know who's going to be out there. So this whole page for the seller side is to let them know and, and ask the question, can you tell me how much you owe on the property? Do you have a loan? Do you have a second? Do you have any lines of credit against the property? Have you used it as collateral for anything? Um, this is the question where I'm going to go back to this net sheet and say, Mr. Seller, you signed a net sheet telling me you only had a first and you net didn't say anything about the fact that you took out a HELOC and used the money to put in a pool that's already at the property. So of course we have to pay that off because it's, it's something that's leaned against it. Um, if you have a client that has uh, tax judgments or tax liens, it's not your job to go and investigate to find out what, how much they are, but it is your job to ask the question, do you have any other liens? And if they do, you can put it here. Um, Again, it just comes out with that whole cost analysis of what the payment is. And then I always like to add a mortgage payment because no matter what happens within that 30 days from when we list the home to when we close on it or whatever happens, they may have some, some mortgage payments that are made. That's real money out of their pocket. And that money's not going to the down payment or to the property's proceeds. It's going to interest most of it. And so if you add it in here, it just shows um, that you're, you're thinking of all the pieces. You always want to tell a client to make their payments until the bank tells them to stop. Because what will happen is they're set to close on the 20th of the month, the same day their mortgage payments do, right? So, oh, I won't make the payment because they're paying off the loan. And then the deal gets extended for three days. And then they finally do close. And then it takes title because of a holiday or an extra day, three more days to process the, the payments. And then it takes the bank two or three days to get it. Well, guess what? They didn't make their payment on time. Now they have a late payment right? You never want to risk that. I always tell people make the payment and then ask for the money back later. It's easier uh, than, than being late. 
On the buyer side, um, this is the important page where it finally tells them, Mr. Buyer, here's how much money you need to be able to have in the bank to be able to buy this home and be able to close on it. And if I don't know this answer to this question, how can I take a buyer out to buy homes? If this number says $15,000 and they've only got $3,000 in the bank, why am I showing them any property? I mean, it just stands to reason that it's a complete waste of my time unless they understand it. If they're approved for a $300,000 mortgage, but they only can afford a $1,200 payment, those things aren't gonna come together. And so sometimes people think, oh yeah, I can afford 1200 a month like my rent, but when they pay rent, they don't pay property taxes. They don't pay for insurance on the home. They don't pay for the CIC and uh, sit and live fee on the property. So the reason why this is also important is you're able to tell them, yes, you're gonna be at $1,200 for your monthly principal and interest payment, but when you add up all the other items, you're really at $1,700 a month. Can you afford that? And that's the whole point of having this in front of them for a buyer uh, so that they don't feel like, like they've been you know, taken advantage of later on down the road. Also in here, um, the board took the opportunity to note a number of things that could happen. And present in the back, all of those terms and things, client, you know, when they have this on their own, can go back and actually look and see uh, what these fees are about. Is there any questions on the NetSheet page and how to use it? Wow, okay, that's pretty easy. So um, when do I do a net sheet? All right, well, if I'm meeting with a buyer, it should be part of my buyer consultation. When we finally write an offer on the property, the first document before I write the offer, hopefully, is my duties owed. After the duties owed should be the net sheet and then the offer. In my opinion, that's how I do my business. If I'm doing a, a buyer consultation, the first document, again, duties owed, net sheet to understand what the possibility of purchase will be, and then my buyer brokerage agreement. I believe that I owe them the responsibility as Vaughn has said in many of her classes and in her uh, teaching that you have to do the duties owed first. It's required that it's signed before any contractual document. And then before you, I can have you sign a contract. I got to tell you how much it's going to cost. So I put the net sheet next, and then I have you sign the offer so that you understand the cost that you're going to incur. Now, on my phone, I have an app that will let me do the entire net sheet in a much more friendly, easy to read format that doesn't do all of these little individual pieces. And so whatever I do on my phone, same thing, I need to create one, I need to put it into my presentation and have it signed before they sign the offer. When I'm listing a home, before I can go out and sell the client on my listing strategy, I always sell the client on the net. That's the only way to do it, in my opinion, to guarantee that you're going to get the listing every time. I could put in a 10% trans, uh, commission. And if they're okay with the net, it's hard to argue my commission anymore, right? Will this $80,000 get you to your next home and be enough for a down payment? Yeah, absolutely, Chris. That's plenty of money. Okay, great. Well, Chris, how much is your commission? Well, wait a minute. Didn't you say that $80,000 was going to get you where you needed to be? Well, well yeah, but I, I just want to know how much your commission is. I said, okay, great. I just want to make sure I'm, I got this right. Are you more concerned about how much you're going to net or how much you're going to pay me? Well, of course, how much we're going to net. I said, okay, great. My commission's 10%. Well, 10%, oh my goodness, that's a lot of money. You're right. I'm going to do a lot for it, but that's what I charge. And let's just say it's 7%. That's, that's what I charge for the job I'm going to do because I'm going to get you that price based on the marketing strategy we have. And that's what I'm working towards. So wouldn't you agree if I can help you get it, I've earned the money. It's just another way that you can argue and fight for your commission. But again, they've already said, yes, Chris, that net's perfect. That's exactly what we need. I'd rather have them in that position. So um, when, when you do anything financial in a, in a transaction, such as the home inspection and looking at repairs, repairs will change the net for a seller. Repairs could change the cost for a buyer. You should do a net sheet. When it comes to the appraisal and the home appraising or not appraising, if it changes the net to the seller or changes the cost to the buyer, you should do a net sheet. After that point, after the appraisal has been brought in and nothing else has changed, you don't need to send them one just for fun. They're going to get an estimated net sheet that's going to come from escrow. Now, most of the times escrow is going to send it directly to the client. Before they sign any closing documents, you as the agent should look over the net sheet and make sure it matches the residential purchase agreement for its terms, make sure that it matches the listing agreement for your fees, and make sure that it matches the net sheet for your costs. 
I like to bring my net sheet, my most recent one that they've signed and their closing disclosure together with me to a signing so that I can show them I reviewed the cost and it matches what I estimated for you or here's where it's different because of things that you decided on. If those documents aren't with me and they're closing on their home and they have to come up with more money than they expected or planned for, there's no scenario that doesn't point the finger back at you and ask you how you're gonna fix it. So just my two cents on it, that's all I got. What other questions can I answer for you guys on NetSheets? Cindy, Michelle, Patty, anything at all? Good job. Okay, so the important thing with a NetSheet, it's no good if you don't use it. Um, there's also a document in Transaction Desk for multiple offer evaluations. So if I'm the listing agent and I get four offers in on a property, there's a net sheet that allows you a quick glance type view. It's seeing the net for all four of those offers. That's the only way I would present multiple offers to a seller. Because again, if I can't show you how much it's gonna net you, how can I present it to you to make a decision? So I would recommend that you use that as well. And that's it. If you guys have any more questions on it, this video will be recorded, it has been. So it'll be available in the video drive. Um, it'll be on Facebook, um, posted up there with our video section. And I'm happy to answer any questions as you do net sheets down the road. Thank you, Chris. Appreciate Thanks, it. Chris. Thanks, guys. Have a great, great rest of your day. You too. Yeah.